Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and welcome to another lively online conversation presented in partnership with the Berkshire Eagle and co-sponsored by Berkshire Bank and Berkshire Gas. We're very grateful to each of them for supporting these opportunities to gather and learn together online when we cannot do so safely in person. My name is Megan Wilden, and it is an honor and delight to be the Executive Director of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. For those who are not familiar with us, OLLI at BCC provides educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people um, 50 years old and better. We have over 1,300 members and produce over 120 different programs a year from classes in science and literature to distinguished speakers, special events, and more. Since mid-March, we have been presenting all of our courses, talks, special events, and groups online via Zoom. Our members are just like you, interested in the world and learning more about it from great speakers and instructors in wonderful company. If you're not yet a member, I encourage you to consider joining. Our fall semester of non-credit online classes with no tests and no grades begin September 21st and can be enjoyed from wherever you are. Tonight, I am absolutely delighted to present our featured speaker, Professor Tom Nichols of the Naval War College. Welcome, Tom. He is a frequent commentator on Morning Joe and other news and opinion programs and the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Death of Expertise, the Campaign Against Established Knowledge and Why It Matters, published by Oxford University Press and now in paperback. Whoops, I have to be careful to make sure I don't, oh dear, completely disappear. <laughs> I don't know why that book makes it do it. I haven't seen that happen before. Tom is a Western Massachusetts Massachusetts native, born and raised in Chicopee, and one of his first political acts was when he was working in the Massachusetts State House, and he and Berkshire Gas's Chris Farrell worked with a group of Chicopee school children to have Arlo Guthrie's song Massachusetts, Massachusetts adopted as the state's official folk song. I love that story. After that triumph, he continued to excel in many ways, serving as a key staffer on Soviet national security issues in the US Senate. He holds a bachelor's degree from Boston University, a master's from Columbia, and a doctorate from Georgetown. He has also taught at Dartmouth and Howard, in, at Harvard, I mean. In 2011, Nichols was named a fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. He has been described as one of the most eloquent conservative voices against President Trump, leaving the Republican Party in 2018 and now serving as a senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. His previous books include The Russian Presidency, Society and Politics in the Second Russian Republic, Eve of Destruction, The Coming Age of Preventative War, and No Use, Nuclear Weapons and U.S. National Security. He's currently working on his next book entitled Our Own Worst Enemy, which is scheduled to be released in the spring of 2021 by Oxford University Press. He's written for The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and many other outlets and has over 400,000 followers on Twitter. Pretty famous on Twitter he is. Pretty outspoken too, you definitely wanna look him up. And finally, he also happens to be a five-time undefeated Jeopardy champion. So if you want to ask him a question in the form of an answer, I think that would be acceptable, yes? Great. And we're also, so welcome, Tom. We're also delighted, delighted to have Kevin Moran back. He is the executive editor of the New England News Group, which includes the Berkshire Eagle, the Bennington Banner, the Brattleboro, reformer and the Manchester leader, the latter three all in Vermont. He has worked for the Berkshire Eagle in a variety of capacities for over two decades, during which the newspaper has earned numerous awards. But my favorite fact about Kevin is that he is a longtime member of a punk rock band that once played CBGBs in New York City, I just found out, or maybe it was more than once. So there you have it. Arlo Guthrie, punk rock coming together we're in for a terrific evening of conversation tonight or this afternoon, depending on where you are. 
A reminder that questions and comments for Professor Nichols are welcomed and encouraged. Please submit and this meeting is being recorded. Please submit them via the chat box found at the bottom of your screen on most devices, and we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of the program. So Tom and Kevin, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, and uh, thank you to everyone who's here. And Tom Nichols, uh, it's great to be with you tonight. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good great. To be with you. I wish I oh. were with you in Western Mass. Oh, it's excellent. Well, we're keeping it real here in Western Massachusetts. L listen, you, you really are, um, you know, an expert on expertise. But, you know, for those folks who might not have, have, read, your, have read your book, The Death of Expertise, uh, maybe you could just briefly sort of set the table by sort of what, you know, the premise of, of, the, of your argument is the death of expertise. Sure. And let me begin by reminding everybody I don't speak for the Naval War College or the Lincoln Project or Harvard Extension School or anybody else. Um, well, I wrote the book uh, because I was disturbed about the ways in which people were reacting to expertise. And it, at first, I think most people assume that what I mean is that people just don't trust experts or they don't trust intellectuals. And that's not really what led me to write the book. I mean, people not liking intellectuals, um, you know, that's an old problem. Uh, that's, you know, if you're a professor, you kind of get used to that. I tell a story uh, in the book. My brother used to own a bar in, uh, God rest his soul, he used to own a bar in Chicopee. And um, I would come down to see him and we'd sit there. And one night I was there and I left to go back up to Dartmouth. And my brother delighted in telling me later that a guy at the bar said, uh, so your brother's a professor, huh? Uh, and my brother said, yeah. And he said, hmm, seems like a good guy anyway. Uh, that's, that's a really, that's normal. I mean, people are uncomfortable to some extent with, you know, pointy heads and experts and white jackets and professors. What, what was different and what made me write the book was a phenomenon where people started to think they knew more than experts, where they started this, there was this phenomenon that a lot of us who work in expert fields, and, and by that, I don't mean professionals, I don't just mean PhDs or engineers, um, even people who were professionals in their trades, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, um, were saying that people were coming up to them and giving them advice or lecturing at them about their own field of expertise. It happened to me um, multiple times in the case of my own field, which is, as Megan pointed out, I, I was a specialist in Soviet and Russian affairs for years. And um, a young person who didn't like something I was saying about Edward Snowden, which is a story in itself, said to me, um, Tom, I don't think you understand Russia. Let me explain this to you. Let me explain Russia to you. And I, I just stopped and said, no, we're not going to do it that way. And uh, that's what led me to write the original essay called The, De in the Death of Expertise. And um, that part, uh, Oxford actually contacted me after seeing that. Writing the book was, wasn't my idea. I, I didn't know if people really wanted to listen to me complain about this. Um, but as turned out um, that other people in other professions, doctors, teachers, lawyers, engineers, you name it, um, we're all having the same problem of people saying, um, you know, let me tell you about your own field. And that's, that's what spurred me to write the book. That's the problem I started out to investigate. Can, can you pinpoint for us uh, perhaps a time, and, and maybe there have been multiple times throughout history, uh, you, you, you would know obviously, uh, in which we've, we've, we've waxed and waned toward respect for experts. And, and maybe let's, if you could perhaps uh, give us some, uh, you know, a moment or some examples within the past, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 years, maybe you know, 40 years, um, 50 years perhaps, uh, that really sort of ch have changed the, the, the dynamic uh, and, and have had, you know, and, and sort of free internet, it really changed the dynamic where, folks started to question experts. Has that always been with us in some degree, in some small small case, people doubting the experts? And what's our big moment here, our latest tipping point? Yeah, doubting experts is normal. Again, people are mistrustful. If you go to a doctor and he says, I have to saw your leg off, you know, most people say, oh, you know, nobody just says, okay, doc, knock yourself out. They say, wait, I, I have questions. I want to talk to another doctor. Um, what's new, and I think what what is primarily a postmodern phenomenon, meaning roughly since the 70s, is people walking in and saying, and this is actually a doctor I interviewed for this told me, um, and it was a story I heard many times, people walking in and saying, okay, doc, here's what I've got, here's what you're gonna do. 
That's the part that's different. That's the part that has really uh, changed. Now, if you look back, the, the golden age of expertise, at least in, the, in recent American history, is from the end of World War II up through the 1970s, maybe into the 1980s, uh, because experts were basically reconstructing a world that was shattered by war. Experts were putting together the Bretton Woods Agreement. They were putting together NATO. They were putting together the United Nations, um, diplomats, scientists. Um, you know, there was just a kind of all hands effort among experts, intellectuals, um, in all fields, government, science, and so on. And, you know, this is, of course, when we were kids, it was always the, hey, they can put a man on the moon. Um, you know, we, we, we went to the moon so many times, we got bored with it when our astronauts started whacking golf balls off the lunar surface. So there, that was a kind of golden age of respect for expertise. Part of the story here is the collapse of trust in everything after Watergate, after Vietnam, after stagflation, oil shocks, all of the kind of traumas of the 70s um, that I will, just, I will just antagonize younger viewers right now and say, all of which were much worse actually than um, at least until COVID than, than the past few years were economically. I mean, it was really, a, to, to remember the early 1970s, it is a really bleak time. And I think that kind of stamped an impression on people that, hey, you know, like the first time it occurs to a lot of people, hey, maybe the people in charge really don't know what they're doing, or maybe they, they can't control this. Um, before then, you didn't have, and I point this out in the book, you didn't have a lot of opportunities for experts and the public to, to rub shoulders as closely as they do now. Um, it was unusual to know people who had gone to college. It was even kind of a hit or miss thing to know people who had graduated from high school. Neither one of my parents um, graduated from high school. I mean, just to be clear, I am not the, prob the product of some privileged educational background. My parents, uh, my mom and dad respectively were ninth and 10th grade dropouts. That was more common. Um, so the idea that you knew a doctor, I mean, I'm, my growing up in my church community, you know, there was one guy who was a doctor and he could have told us the moon was made of green cheese and we would have believed him because, hey, you know, how many doctors did you know? But I'm glad you brought up the internet um, because this isn't a result of the internet. The internet just put it all on steroids and it brought experts and ordinary citizens, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and ordinary citizens much closer together, uh, basically so they could antagonize each other which is pretty much what the internet has done for all of us. It's, it's introduced us all to each other and, and kind of taught us that we don't like to talk to each other um, civilly, but it predates it. And I would argue if you're looking for a date and time, um, there's a reason that Tom Wolfe called the 1970s the me decade. Um, I think this is really the product of an epidemic of narcissism in modern developed societies, particularly in the United States, but not limited to it. And I think the growth of that narcissism after the early 1970s, like late 60s, early 70s, produced successive generations of people who just couldn't stand to ever be told they were wrong or that they didn't know enough about something or that they would have to actually have to listen to someone else. And I think that's what got us where we are. One of the things is one of the expectations, one of the arguments uh, as the internet sort of you know, came, became more popular was that this is gonna be you know, greatly democratized uh, the earth. And to your point, uh, it, it, it merely made uh, the megaphone louder. But, you know, but, you know, here now we are in, in the internet era, everybody's got that megaphone, everyone can find their corners of the internet, which uh, they can then blast out. Um, but then we have, you know, our most recent experience is this pandemic. Um, what, in your opinion, has, the, has, what effect has the pandemic had on on this, I mean, we are we are physically distant, socially distant, and uh, and now, you know, for, for better or for worse, the internet and social media. My gosh, we never did Zoom three months ago, four months ago, and here we are. Um, you know, what has been the effect of the pandemic on uh, on our national dialogue when it comes uh, to expertise and when it comes to some of these issues? I mean, not only COVID nineteen itself, but uh, uh, you know, race and politics and campaigning and all the rigmarole that's gone on with this. I mean, it's, it, it really feels like a mess. Well, let me say two things. One is, uh, just so that I'm not misunderstood, I, I love technology and I love the internet. I mean, I was an early adopter. Um, 
you know, I was the guy uh, when I, I started my teaching career, my full-time teaching career when I was 28 uh, in 1989. And um, at Dartmouth College, I was my department's computer committee. I was, you know, the committee of one. An older faculty member came in and said, uh, you know, you're a junior guy. Uh, you seem to know what you're doing. Uh, you're the computer committee. And, um, um, I, you know, I was the guy that pulled everybody into my office saying, look at this cool thing called a browser. And it attaches you to something called the web. Uh, so I was one of those internet optimists. And I actually think there is a, a good, there was a good reason for optimism. I mean, I, I think telecommunications, even more than I expected at the time, helped to bring down the Soviet Union. I think that um, the internet and uh, smartphones and instant communication and messaging are among the most powerful weapons for democracy because authoritarians hate it when people actually talk to each other. So, you know, I, I was one of those people who believed in technology as a force for good. The problem is when it, um, it does democratize knowledge, it does democratize communications, but without any kind of gatekeeping at all. So it's, you know, like we all like to throw a party, but nobody walks down the street saying, anybody who wants to walk into my house and have a drink should come in and have a drink. Um, and I think that's been part of the problem. The, the second part, to, to answer your question, Kevin, about the, the pandemic, um, academics like me hate to ever say they're wrong about anything, but I was wrong. I, for, for years, uh, for the few years that I was on the road talking about the book after it came out, uh, I said, you know, a, a disaster will snap us out of this, a war, a depression, or a pandemic. I mean, I, when I was on the road, I said the word pandemic like every time. Uh, because I thought, you know, we're affluent and we're lazy and we're kind of spoiled, but, you know, we know how to pull together. We have it. Um, I think this has deepened respect for expertise who were already inclined to respect science and knowledge and expertise. And it has deepened mistrust among people who were already inclined to mistrust expertise. What I didn't count on and what I think is different in this circumstance is that I did not count on a, a political leader and an entire political party that would make science into this kind of a partisan issue. Now, let me just back up and, and then I'll get off this soapbox for a minute, but science is always a partisan issue. Um, anybody who's ever had a, a, an argument about climate change or abortion or gender or education, science is always something that becomes a partisan football because we disagree about whose data is better, what does it really mean, what are the, you know, what are the conclusions for public policy and so on. What I mean here is that I did not count on a situation in which an entire political party would say you should risk death as a show of loyalty um, under these political circumstances. Like that really caught me by surprise and I think now we're, we're in a kind of hopeless situation. That's why the rest of the world is recovering from this pandemic. And we're all that we're left to argue about is whether the final death toll is going to be closer to 300,000. If we, if we may, uh, let's skip ahead a little bit to the future. And, um, and if we could, uh, let's, let's put that future at November 3rd, 2020. And, uh, and if you could all, you could let us in, uh, this audience in on, on uh, what Tom Nichols' brain is thinking the morning he wakes up on November 3rd, 2020, election day, Trump versus Biden, uh, Senate, House. Uh, what are you thinking? Um, Unless there is a massive win for Joe Biden, an incontestable win by that evening, and there almost certainly won't be, because that's just not the nature of our system anymore. My, I think November 3rd is going to be a terrible day because it's going to kick off weeks of one of the most dangerous periods in American history. What I think will happen is that um, most of Biden's voters will have voted early or by mail. Um, most of the president's supporters will vote in person. So the early returns will look like a Trump victory because those are the returns they're gonna count first. It's just exit polls and whoever was at the polling stations and then they have to count all the mail ballots, all the absentee ballots, ballots and all that stuff. Um, the president's gonna claim victory, I would argue almost no matter, again, unless there's this you know, 45 state blowout and 400 electoral votes, the president's gonna claim victory. 
And then he is going to set about basically burning down the American electoral system for the next two or three weeks to do anything he can to effectively forestall the December meeting of the Electoral College. And we will be in really one of the most perilous places we have ever been since the Civil War. Hmm. But I'm but, sorry to brighten everybody's day by saying that. Um, well, but, but it's but it's serious. But in, in some, but, but we can you know we can ask uh, you know but, but we can say but but Tom, you were a Republican at one point. What happened? Yeah, I kind of like to know that myself. Actually, um, I think there were several things that happened. And you know, if you talk to my never Trump former Republican colleagues, you'll get different kind of versions through this prism of what happened. Um, I, I think several things contributed to this level of polarization, some of which I, I hadn't thought of and some of my friends on the left ha have made me more, more aware of. First, let's do the mea culpas and just get them out of the way. It, it is true that within the Republican Party, people like me, a Massachusetts Republican, a New England Republican, coming from that kind of squishy Mitt Romney, Olympia Dukakis kind of, you know, Ed Brooke, sort of school of um, Republicanism, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at who else was on the bus with us. Um, you know, we sort of understood that there had to be red meat thrown to the political evangelicals and the Southern, you know, Confederate flag guys and the kooky gun owner mountain folks, you know, but we just figured that the party was primarily an intellectual party. Um, I think it's important to remember that in 1980, it was Daniel, the year I cast my first presidential vote, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, liberal Democratic Senator from New York, referred to the Republican Party as the party of ideas. Um, that was what brought me in, was this was the party that had dynamism and energy, and the Democrats were this sort of exhausted kind of machine boss, union politics kind of spent force. I think what happened over the years, um, one of the interesting things that I, I, I had not thought about, but I think is really interesting, the broadening of college education among both suburban Republicans and Democrats started to put distance between the institutional parties themselves and the rank and file. And the Democrats were much more adept at this. Um, the Republicans realized that there was a kind of gap forming and they decided that the way to keep their base mobilized and engaged with them was to use these new tools like cable, television, the internet, and so on, to basically go down the road of culture war. Um, and I, I will lay some of this, I mean, that is a Republican problem. I will lay some of this at the feet of my friends in the Democratic Party because I think they just basically wrote off um, the entire white working class and said, well, that's just racism and, you know, that's, like, to this day, I think there are Democrats who still don't understand how Ronald Reagan won 49 states in 1980. Like, it's still a mystery to them. Um, but Republicans, I think, found that this was a really powerful engine to generate money, direct mail, get cable TV, things like that. And they, they ended up creating a monster that, that just ate them because then a reality TV star came along and said, um, you know, I can just blow out the Republican establishment because they just don't trust you anymore because they don't trust anybody who is like Rick Santorum at one point said, we don't like professors and scientists because smart people aren't on our side. He actually said this in 2012, which is kind of crazy. Um, and, and Trump came along and said, um, you know, all I have to do is feed people enough rage and anger and that'll work. And I, I think when you look at the number of the, this is part of a global populist shift of wealthy, hard, wealthy patrons of parties um, in places like Italy and Britain and Poland and Hungary, all pumping the same message of you're the real country, those educated elites are, aren't really, you know, your country. And um, I mean, that's my 10, you know, eight, 10 minute kind of um, quick summary of where I think the Republicans went wrong. I also think people should take a look at, uh, there's a really good book that Ann Applebaum just published about the twilight of democracy. And she puts a lot of it on, on um, the kind of professional class of pundits who emerged in the 90s, the Laura Ingraham, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson group, 
who actually started off like me as optimistic, can-do young Reaganites and decided that that was just too boring and not making them famous fast enough. And they decided to, you know, how do you get a TV show? You say really insane stuff and develop a, a devoted cult following. And, you know, I, I guess if you are amoral enough and you want it badly enough, that's the road you go down. So here we are. Tom, was there a moment for you, um, re you know, that sort of turned you, uh, you know, as a Republican and um, in that moment? And then how did that, if, if, if there was a moment like that, how, what path did you follow that, that eventually led you um, to be an advisor to the Lincoln Project, uh, which is, you know, really interesting. And I got to hand it to you, uh, really compelling. Uh, I mean, the, I, and I we're not could, making stuff up here either. Yeah, I, I wish I could take credit for the creative stuff. I, I've only worked on a couple of their ads. Um, but those guys, I mean, the, the, your question is basically, how did a nice boy like me end up on a pirate ship? Um, and, and these guys are pirates. Um, <laughs> There were two moments and, and they were moments. Um, one was in 2012 during the um, primary, Republican primaries and Ron Paul, who I think is a kook, uh, nonetheless was even shocked by the, he said, well, they were talking about insurance and he said, well, if a guy has an auto, automobile, you know, motorcycle accident, what do you want me to do? Let him die? And the crowd started shouting, yes. They went into this kind of, you know, give us Barabbas kind of transport that, I, that even Ron Paul, you know, kind of shrunk from. He's like, I'm a doctor, I can't, you know. Um, and I said, there's, and then, and then Newt Gingrich, who I think is, even when I was a Republican, I always thought of as just a detestable human being, um, won the South Carolina primary. And I said, you know, I, I can't be in a party that takes Newt Gingrich seriously. And I, I for, for years, I just deregistered as a Republican and I said, uh, you know, but it didn't feel right. I said, oh, my heart's still kind of with the party. I, I worked for John Hines in the Senate, a good, decent man, a moderate Pennsylvania Republican. You know, I just didn't feel right to walk away. And when Trump started to gain power, I said, if, if, we, if moderate Republicans aren't in the party, there is no voice for us. So I, I said, I'm going to stay a Republican, I'm gonna come back in, I'm going to fight Trump all I can. The second moment, however, and it will sound strange because you wouldn't think that this is a person who could affect anybody. Um, but the person who really drove me out of the Republican party was Susan Collins, because I was still hanging in there saying, this is terrible, but there are still moderates. There are still people like Susan Collins. There are still people like Mitt Romney. There are still people like Jeff Flake. They're gonna hang in there. And when Susan Collins came out during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation and gave this kind of sanctimonious finger wagging lecture about, you know, the, about the importance of respecting the Senate and, you know, Kavanaugh's legal theories. I, I just said, you know, they've all sold their souls. There are no moderate Republicans left. And that's why I, I'm working on a piece right now um, that should be out soon that basically is restates an argument I've been making for a while, which is that the Republican party is not salvageable. It has to literally be burned down so that it can start again with people that are not tainted by this, including people like Collins and Cory Gardner and you know the other supposed moderates. Uh, one of the questions I get asked about the Lincoln people is why are you going after these you know, otherwise inoffensive Republicans? And I think most, again, I don't, I don't speak for all the entire Lincoln project, but I think you'd find a lot of my colleagues would say because they were the ones who were supposed to know better. Hmm. You know, nobody expects Louis Gohmert or Jim Jordan to be a sensible person. But when you're Susan Collins and you've built a whole reputation on, I'm a maverick, I'm a moderate, I will do the right thing, I will buck the party. And Susan Collins, like everybody else has fallen right in line. And that was that I was actually in a TV, I was in a radio studio, I was at WBUR, we were all watching her speech and I just turned to the host, a um, um, lovely person named Tiziana Deering, and I said, that's it, I'm out, I'm done. That this was the moment. And I got on the train, I went back to Rhode Island and I wrote a piece um, that came out in the Atlantic uh, about two years ago where I just said, I'm, I'm done, I'm, I'm finished as a Republican forever. Uh, Tom, if you could just quickly uh, encapsulate what the Lincoln Project is all about. There's a couple of comments in the section that um, 
people are looking for a, a little bit of an explanation on what, what that is. And rather than me define it, you define it. Defeating Trump and Trumpism. That's it. I think if, you know, I know that Reed Galen and Rick Wilson and John Weaver and all, you know, Schmidt, all these guys have been all asked the same question. And they say, defeat Trump, defeat Trumpism. Take out Trump and his enablers at every level of the political system. And I know that there is always a sense of, oh, you know, you guys want to be part of a Biden administration or you want to advise the Democratic Party. None of us that, I, in my experience, and I know all these guys personally, I have never heard anybody talk that way. We all get it that, you know, after November 3rd, most of the Democrats are going to say, well, you know, thanks for being part of the coalition, um, you know, but Joe Biden's going to be Joe Biden. And I think all of us are fine with that. I think we all banded together out of a sense that Donald Trump is really not even a representative of the right or the left or a Republican or a Democrat, but he is an existential threat to the constitutional order of the United States. And here we sit, you know, on the brink of civil chaos that the president himself is instigating. And I think, um, you know, that if you ask, again, the people that I don't speak for, but that I think I know them pretty well, they would say, um, our goal is to see Joe Biden put his hand on the Bible and say, so help me God. Beyond that, um, I, I couldn't tell you. And I don't think we need more of an agenda beyond that. And, and, and there might be, you know, there's a lot of people out there and maybe some people watching tonight saying to themselves, but, but wait, Donald Trump is my, is my president. He's my, he's my leader. He's my, He's the guy I voted for in 2016, and he's the guy I'm voting for on November 3rd. What do you say to those people um, when you say when you say that Trump is an existential threat to the you know Constitution? Um, what is the what is your argument? Well, um, I could sit here for another hour and reel off the various offenses against the Constitution, um, starting with. Um, the impeachment that should have been successful. Um, again, and also I would add again, part of my argument against the entire Republican party is I've never seen people vote not to hear evidence. Um, Donald Trump tried to, he violated the constitution to try to alter an American election with foreign help for his personal benefit. He, I mean, there is no greater law breaking than trying to accept and solicit the help of a foreign power. He has already said, if the Russians, Chinese, you know, he was asked, would you take help from a foreign power? He said, well, I have to take a look, I have to see what they're offering. Um, he tried to blackmail an American friend to the benefit of an American enemy to survive his own election. That alone should have been enough. He directed the Justice Department to interfere in things like business mergers, which, of course, especially for Republicans, the idea that the government, you know, puts, it, puts the heavy hand in and starts trying to pick winners and losers. He, his, um, his staff violates federal raw, law regularly using the White House and their official positions, which is one of the reasons I sit here and tell you I'm on my own time, I don't represent anybody, um, for political gain. Um, he has appointed his children, his son-in-law. Part of the reason we are all still in the middle of this pandemic is because instead of uh, um, listening to people whose job it is to protect our public health, he farmed it out to his son-in-law because he doesn't trust anybody else. I mean, I, you know, there are entire, literally at this point, there have been books written about Donald Trump's serial crimes against the, against the law and against the constitution. Um, today, just today, Bill, Bill Barr, before we began tonight, the attorney general, who I think is at this point the most dangerous man in Washington, has already said that, you know, the election could be falsified, foreign powers are going to steal it. I mean, these are, I have never seen an American administration spend so much time trying to delegitimize the American electoral system. And it's because they basically have decided, like a criminal enterprise, that they're sticking around no matter what happens. This is, this is so fundamentally an offense against the rule of law and the constitution. But I guess I would say to the people you mentioned, Kevin, you made a mistake four years ago. You have a chance to, to, to rectify that now. Um, and if you are an enthusiastic supporter of Donald Trump, I, I, you know, then I can't help but make, reach conclusions about your character and your patriotism um, for that matter. 
Thanks, thanks, Tom. Well, uh, I see a number of uh, of people um, adding some comments on the, on the sidebar in the chat that we can see, and and, uh, and and one of the things is 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 let's uh, let's say that on on November fourth, um, things aren't necessarily the way that you think they might be. Uh, you, you know, a, a lot of chaos and confusion and uh, and what have you. But but say that you know there's a clear and definitive change in the administration. I have a you know a couple of questions that are sort of aligning with, with some people wondering what mm -hmm. what happens to the republic how does the republican party sort of rebuild um how how does it get its expertise back what does mitch mcconnell uh do <laughs> what does he become uh as a result of this uh change person not a change person um your thought and for that matter it, it, it's a risk of asking four questions in one and i apologize for that <laughs> But but seriously, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, the you know the White House is in Democratic hands. How do we restore expertise? Presuming that Democrats could restore. Well, you're not going to restore it by. Um, I mean, I think the people who have decided that experts are their enemies, uh, they're mostly older people. Um, you know, and for anybody that's mad at me about that, I mean, people you know my age. I'm 59. Um, that these are mostly people. Uh, in their 50s and 60s at this point, um, you're not going to, they're not coming back. They're in, they're way up that tree now, like a cat that has climbed to the very top. They're not, they're not going to climb down. Um, I think that there are people who will literally go to their graves thinking that COVID was a hoax. Um, you know, that um, China, it's a bi Chinese bioweapon, all that stuff. You're not going to talk people out of that. Um, I think uh, that I, that I, I think, though, there will be people who will almost be relieved if Donald Trump loses because they'll be able to come down off that cross and stop defending him. I think you'll see a lot of elected Republicans trying to recover their credibility, stepping forward, saying, I never believed any of this stuff. I had to, you know, I was kind of stuck and, you know, the voters loved him. And what could I do? Because you're already seeing some of that behavior now. You, you've already seen Mitch McConnell, to answer your question about McConnell, um, saying to elected Republicans, you know, if you have to start walking away, it's okay to do that. Um, McConnell, I don't believe, cares about anything but Mitch McConnell and being the majority leader of the Senate. I think of Mitch McConnell as a kind of amoral cyborg um, who, you know, cares about power and remaining in the Senate. Um, and I think he would just be just as glad to be rid of Trump as long as he doesn't lose his Senate majority, which is what he really, which is really his what he cares about. Um, I, I think in the ensuing period, the expertise and trust and expertise will be tested because if this is a democratic win, Trump is going to challenge it anyway. And there will be a lot of stuff lying around in the public domain about numbers and statistics and legal arguments that people will feel the need to weigh in on even if they don't know anything about it. Um, which is one of the hallmarks of this problem that I started writing about people, you know, people who want to give advice to pilots who are flying airplanes. Um, so I think we're in for a rough ride no matter what happens. And I think, um, you know, if, if Biden takes office uh, in January, um, that some of this will just die down because a lot of it at this point is a full on full court press against expertise in the service of a partisan campaign. And I, I don't, again, I'm almost flummoxed by that. I'm almost like, I almost don't know how to deal with people who say where that, you know, wearing a mask is a political symbol. Um, when I'm just, you know, I'm 59 and I wear a mask when I go out because I don't want to die. Uh, so um, I suspect a lot of those people will just kind of let it go because they won't have a reason anymore to make a big deal about it because it's an extension of their personal partisanship. But I, I think that, you know, this, this wound that's been inflicted on the country is deep. And I, and I have to say one more thing in an attempt to be a little more even handed here, because the other wound that's been inflicted because of COVID-19 was that experts who told us not to gather in groups suddenly thought it was totally okay to have gigantic marches in April and May um, after the George Floyd killing. Now, I am not questioning the justice of the cause. Like every other American, I was absolutely appalled by what I saw. I'm 
I, there, I have two police officers in my family, now of blessed memory. Um, but when experts say, don't do this, and then they turn around and say, but if that's your cause, well, then go ahead and do it. That's okay. That I think was highly destructive and it, and it contributed to this sense that experts are taking political sides. And I don't think that really helped anybody. Uh, what, what are the, either way, whatever happens uh, on November 3rd, I mean, you know, is there any salvaging um, expertise and, and how do we well, restore the integrity and the credibility of, uh, of uh, expert institutions for, and let me just lay it out sort of on a personal level as an editor of a newspaper and represent uh, you know, to some degree, um, you know, uh, you, all of media, I suppose, in this particular seat, in this particular moment, um, you know, we are uh, having to, we, we, we literally had been in the business of, of literally trying our best to print facts every day. And, and now um, we seem to be pretty, printing a lot of uh, lies and explaining that this is this is not true. Uh, and really, we, we've got, you know, th that's a lot of extra work for us to be able to do. And, and plus, we, you know, to some extent, wouldn't have even thought to have published, you know, this baloney, this malarkey, whether it comes from, uh, you know, a, an individual who's in leadership position or, or groups or, you know, uh, that type of thing. Um, or, or even just sort of contrary arguments to societal things, uh, you know, uh, folks who, uh, you know, are, are don't, who don't like Black Lives Matter or think it's this or that. Um, how, do we, how do we salvage this? I, I mean, I think, you know, you have to understand that there's like so much control you have over this because this predated you, predated Trump, it predated this election. Um, you know, people weren't reading newspapers. Uh, and they're not going to start again. The, the internet is like a gigantic buff the, and cable TV. I, and in the book, I talk about the effect of cable, the advent of cable. You know, cable television is like living next to a McDonald's that gives away free food all day long. And then all of a sudden you're 300 pounds and saying, well, how did I get this way? Well, you know, because, you, because it tastes good. Um, and I, I think until people make a decision to just be more civic and more informed, um, that's not going to change. You know, I was on a panel a few years ago with Dan Baltz of the Washington Post, and someone in the audience stood up and said, well, you know, you guys could help us. You could write more explainer type articles, you know, give us the facts. And Baltz very calmly said, we write them, you won't read them. And um, for those, for people watching who don't realize this, all the major newspapers, if you've ever been inside the newsroom of a place like the Washington Post, they know in real time who's reading what on their site. I mean, it is like a NASA command center in most of these places. They know what articles are being read. They know how long you're dwelling on a page. They know what you're looking at in their newspaper. And the American public just doesn't want to read long, boring articles that explain the budget process or the space program or NATO. That's on us. And so, you know, when you ask what can be done about this, I think some of the solution here, and I'm sorry to say this, some of this is just demographic, that you know this is a generational problem. I think people that are much younger are savvier. They have more experience with digital literacy. I think we could teach more. You know, this is the old solutions. I think we could teach more civics, um, less teaching to the test, more, you know, critical thinking. Um, but I'm more optimistic about the generations coming up in terms of their savviness than I am about the 58-year-old retirees or people just sitting at home just sitting on Facebook all day long, exchanging stupid memes, you know, that, that just confirm them and what they already believe. And I don't think that's going to change uh, for a while. So, I, But I do think that having a different administration in office will let people just come down off of this cross that they feel that, you know, get them off this, get out of this trench that they have to, have to defend 24 hours a day. Because as you point out, Kevin, you are literally fire hosed with I mean, I don't know how many times the president has said, I passed veterans choice. That's not spin. This is what we're not used to. We're used to spin. We're used to shading. We're used to, you know, well, I was in off, you know, John Kerry. Well, I was kind of for it before I was against it because I voted for the appropriation. You know, something that actually requires you to think. The president just stands up there and says, I invented post-its. 
I created scotch. I discovered Antarctica. And, you know, we all kind of go, how can you, you know, how can you say stuff like that? And he just says it and kind of dares you to disagree. And then he moves on. And I think he really struck the media at their weakest point, which is they don't expect people to lie. And when they do, they want to spend some time doing the fact check. Trump knows that that's impossible. And so I think everybody will get a breather from this. Uh, you know, again, if, if Biden is elected, if the president's reelected, God help us. I, I don't know what we do from there. I, I genuinely, I, my, I, I can't even, it's almost like I can't get my head around imagining what four more years of, of this insanity would be like. Are there institutions or people that, uh, that you have, uh, that you hold in high regard or, or that you can point us to if, for example, we're not, we're not going to go through, uh, you know, so, uh, four years of college for, you know, and get, uh, get, a, get a revised civics uh, lesson. Um, but are there, you know, people or institutions right now that you can re recommend to, you know, us, our audience that uh, can serve as, uh, as pathways um, to become more enlightened, to, again, I be more informed? I have a very simple answer. Spend 30 minutes a day reading a reputable newspaper. You know, Thank my you. <laughs> that's it. Um, you know, and what do I mean by reputable? I always tell my students, they say, well, how do I know if something, you know, sucks? And I say, does it have editors? That's the first question. Does it have editors and a corrections page? Um, do they ever admit they're wrong? Is there a page that says, you know, cor corrections? Um, I had a blog some years ago and I took it down because I teach writing. One of the things I teach at Harvard Ex Extension School is a writing course. And I said, you know, um, blogs are poison because, and they're poison to the writer because you're not working with an editor. Mm -hmm. um, and Kevin, let me give a shout out to editors. I won't work with, without an editor anymore. Editors are my best friends. They're the people who send it back, send back the stuff I send them and they save me from myself. Um, you know, where they fact check me or they say, did you really mean to compare, you know, this politician to a giant rabid porcupine? And I say, ah, you know, let me think about that one for a second. Um, so I, I, you know, read a reputable news, read the Boston Globe, read the, my parents, um, you know, the Holyoke transcripts now long gone, of course, but we, we got the union in the morning, we got the transcript at night. There was 28 minutes of news. My, my parents devoured it all. And I would argue that my ninth and 10th grade educated parents were vastly more informed than most people in America today, just by the simple act of reading a morning paper, an evening paper and watching the evening news, which is something people just won't do. And I will, let me just put in a plea here because I know I'm part of the problem when it's, you know, whether it's Morning Joe or, um, you know, Brian Williams or any of the, I've done all these shows on all the networks. Um, I know that, you know, it's a gladiatorial entertainment complex, um, but what happens after seven o'clock on any of the major networks isn't really news. It's, it's, it's partisan entertainment. It's there. It's, it's, it's providing you with something you want to see. News should be a lot of stuff that you didn't really want to hear about, but that you need to know anyway. Um, and so, you know, a half an hour, a half an hour, 40 minutes with a reputable national newspaper, the LA Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, pick your poison. But that alone, that solitary act of reading in, in a quiet environment without people yelling at each other and read it front to back, you know, insofar as you can see front to back on the internet, just do that and you will be better off than 99% of the people in this country as a citizen and as an informed voter. I guarantee you. Thanks, Tom, and appreciate the shout outs for uh, reputable uh, news organizations and, and uh, literally why, what, you know, what helps define a reputa reputable news organization? Well, uh, you know, if anybody's wondering, it's, it's because, uh, you know, we put our reputations, our credibility on the line um, and that if we get it wrong, <laughs> or purposely get it wrong, we can be sued, um, I can be fired, um, we can, you know, all of that can happen. And, and you know, uh, uh, and sort of solo shotgun uh, folks out there sort of on the internet, 
uh, retweeting What's, or blogging uh, can, uh, don't aren't subjected to that same. For, for the uh, people listening who are wondering about this, maybe what's the difference between you know where where you work and Breitbart, or or even for that matter, let me again just to be even handed about it, or the Daily Kos um, on the left. You answer to the public. You are a public institution. You may be privately owned, but you serve the public. Your client is the public. Those are websites that serve partisans who want that who want big helpings of that juicy red meat and they expect it. Those are not news organizations. Those are opinion outlets. In Breitbart's case, I would say not a propaganda outlet, um, but they are already, they are talking to people who already agree with them. You are trying to present facts that have been vetted, that have other people looking over your shoulder to make sure that they are true and accurate and that you are presenting responsible um, journalism. That's most newspapers in America. Um, so, you know, if you turn off cable for an hour a day, sit with a newspaper, open your laptop, open up your, my, my personal favorite is the Washington Post because I worked in Washington and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a geek, you know, I'm a politics wonk. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be a liberal newspaper. The, the Wall Street Journal has great journalism. The opinion page, not to my taste. Um, but, you know, the, the Times, the Post, the Journal, all of these have excellent news organizations. Give yourself a break. Spend 30 minutes with them. Excellent. Uh, Tom, you are uh, obviously an expert on Russia, and you have uh, also, uh, as Megan mentioned or early on in introducing you, uh, you know, a champion uh, Jeopardy player as well. So if I can maybe do a uh, sort of a reverse style Jeopardy question for you on Russia, and maybe have you give us the answer. Um, so here's that question <laughs> uh, in reverse Jeopardy style. Who is Vladimir Putin? Vladimir Putin is an angry, disgruntled former KGB agent who was stationed in Germany um, in a press, it, who he was part of the most important and most prestigious institution in his country. And then he came home from Germany to find out that his entire country collapsed and nobody cared about people like him. He weaseled his way into the democratic movement in Russia, um, made some shady alliances within uh, the intelligence services where he was from, as well as organized crime in the Russian state, which at this point are all the same group, um, and is now the world's most powerful mafia boss. Think of him as Tony Soprano or Vito Corleone with nuclear weapons. He sits atop a mafia, and his goal is to make sure that no one can ever topple him. And part of that goal uh, is to make other democracies look chaotic and shabby uh, so that the Russian people don't get any crazy ideas about ever recovering their freedom. Um, that dovetails nicely with his atavistic instincts as a former KGB officer that NATO and the United States are his biggest enemies. And, and I think the only question that I still have as a Russia expert for myself, I was a lot more optimistic about Putin 20 years ago. Was I wrong or did he change? Um, I, I don't know. I think he was more, I think he wanted to at least try a more democratic path within carefully constrained limits in the, the Russian um, system. I mean, he was picked and picked by Boris Yeltsin for a lot of reasons, including to protect Yeltsin when he retired. Um, but I think after about 2008, he, he realized that he was riding the tiger. Um, this fabulously wealthy man who's at the head of a gigantic criminal empire said, the only way that I can be safe is to stay right where I am at the top here in the Kremlin. And so that's, that's who you're dealing with. You're dealing with a very dangerous man. Um, and I will just um, go back to what I said earlier when you asked me what I would say to people about Donald Trump. This very dangerous man clearly has compromised the president of the United States in some way. Mm. That is, I have no doubt about that. 30 years of shady deals with the Russians um, means that there are people in Moscow who know things about the president and he knows that they know, know things. And in my view, um, he is scared out of his mind of Vladimir Putin. Um, and that has really affected the course of our political life in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine right now. 
but we will, one day we're going to know everything. And I think, you know, people are really, if you're horrified now, you will, you will probably throw up when, when the whole truth comes out. Uh, there's a, I think there's a difference between U.S. Russia relations now uh, versus the Cold War. At least that's my non-expert definitely, definitely. Ob observation. But while I I'm curious as to, uh, this is my perception. Correct me if I'm wrong. That the likelihood of annihilating each other uh, in a anti, you know, in a ballistic missile type war. Is, is less likely today, but the but does Russia perhaps represent more of a threat to the United States today because they can destroy our democracy? Well, I don't blame, you know, this is one place where I part company with a lot of my friends on the left. I don't blame the Russians for 2016. I mean, I think they absolutely tried to interfere in our election. They flooded us with propaganda. They poisoned our social media networks, but we ate that up. We, we are... That's why the title of my next book is Our Own Worst Enemy. We were ready for that. We wanted it. Um, nobody makes you get your news from Facebook. Nobody makes you interact with trolls on Twitter. This is why I keep hammering home you know, 30 minutes with a newspaper. Just get away from that stuff. That's the only place where the Russians can really touch you. The, the more optimistic thing I will say about Russia, U.S.-Russia relations today is uh, there is no overarching Russian ideology that is spanning the globe that is trying to overthrow the United States. We are not having to fight, you know, communist insurgencies in, you know, in Central America and Asia and Africa. The Russians just want, the Russian state is a Putin mafia autocracy. Um, and as long as he can stay at the top of it, he, he's pretty happy. Um, and in, and in fact, I think in some sense, we were overreacting to Russia for a lot of years. Um, I think we, I was actually a, a, a dove on US-Russian relations after the Cold War. I was an old school Reaganite anti-Soviet hawk. And after the Cold War, I wanted us to reach out to the Russians, pull them into the, I was in favor of them joining the G8. I wanted them to be, have full observer status in NATO. Um, I'm, I am still an advocate for unilateral nuclear reductions, all of those things. So yes, we are safer today. The only place we are not safer in that sense is that because Putin is very emotional, as we saw with Crimea, um, he will lash out when he feels threatened. And because the president is simply not very intelligent and not very adept, I worry, I, and I will worry right to the end, uh, and I will still worry even when Biden's president, that the Russians will miscalculate, that Putin will underestimate us and believe that he can take a piece of NATO to, and just sit on it the way he's done in Ukraine just to make a point. And he doesn't understand NATO is tw you know, 29 countries and a lot of things could happen that will could spiral out of control. Um, I, I think he understands that. I think the people around him understand that, but I have never been more worried about the world being run by incompetent and unstable people than I have now, from, from Xi in China to Putin in Russia, Trump in the United States, people like Erdogan, Bolsonaro, Johnson, you know, at this point, Angela Merkel is the only, is the, probably the true leader of the free world at this point, because she's the only person with any sense. So I, I'm, I am worried about accidents and miscalculations uh, in some ways more than I was during the Cold War. Hmm. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Nichols, uh, this has been, you know, a, a really uh, enlightening uh, conversation, and I and I thank you for it. it it's also been scary and sobering, sorry, and uh, scary. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, rather than sort of leaving our segment before we get to questions through Megan, uh, audience questions through Megan, um, what are, what keeps you hopeful? What keeps you ticking? Uh, you know, what light do you see at the end of this tunnel? Uh, and maybe we can leave our segment of this conversation on that note, and then we can hand it over to Megan. Um, I have a, a great faith in um, the human spirit. Um, I think that in the end, um, people do not want to be slaves. People do not want to be told what to do. They don't want to be lied to. Uh, most people, um, I think, are basically good. Uh, and 
Um, you know, in this sense, let me just say, when people, because I people always ask me, what does it still mean to be a conservative? Well, I I think one thing conservatives have always had is a pretty fixed view of human nature, for better or for worse. Um, that you know, we know that people can be terrible, but we also know that it's a permanent part of human nature that they can be um, that they can be good and great. Um, and so that's that's my optimism is that in the end. Uh, I think we have gone through too much as a human civilization uh, over the past 100 years, um, simply to let it all collapse in you know, 90 days. Um, and so I, 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 I hold to that. I, I believe, um, I'm also a religious person. I believe in, I'm a person of faith. Um, and I believe that there is a, um, a benevolent God and that we are basically um, good creatures and we will find our way out of this. Doesn't mean that it can't get a little bumpy uh, on the way out, though. Well, that's a great note for us to leave this part of the conversation uh, with. I, I thank you so much, uh, Tom, for uh, you know uh, taking part in this conversation uh, with me. And uh, with that, thank you. Uh, hope we talk again soon. And uh, when you come back uh, to Western Mass, don't be a stranger. And uh, with that, I will hand it off to Megan. Great, thank you so much. And I apologize uh, that my background is acting a little strange and psychedelic, um, but we have just a ton of questions and comments and I'm gonna try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, I wanna start out with, um, well, first, uh, there were a number of people when you were talking about Trump actually wrote, start talking about the book again, start talking about the book again. So. I thought maybe you could you could start by you know connecting the two. Well, I I think um, it's important to point out I didn't write the book about Trump. The first piece I wrote about this was in late 2013, so this was not some you know this wasn't my kind of disgruntled expert reaction to Donald Trump. I, I and I I hope people understand that because I really wrote the book. I mean I wrote it for a university press for Oxford. It was not it was not a political screed. Um, I wrote it because I was concerned, and I was concerned about um, basically just how our society can function if we don't respect the division of labor. Um, you know, I had a house fire um, a couple of years ago, and it was humbling because I think of myself as a very smart guy, and I have all these, you know, degrees, and I know all this stuff about nuclear weapons, um, and suddenly, you know, I was useless. Uh, <laughs> You know, I was standing there in all this charred wreckage and, you know, nodding as if I knew what was going on. All these guys said, oh, we're going to have to put that there and run this thing. And I'm, and I'm nodding, to, you know, like as if I have any clue <laughs> until finally somebody just like took me by the shoulders and said, okay, Mr. Nichols, you need to move over here so that the chimney doesn't fall on you. Um, and I said, okay, if anybody needs to know anything about nuclear arms negotiations <laughs> with North Korea, I'll be upstairs. Uh, other than that, I'm getting out of the way. And I think we all need to develop a little more of that humility because it's what makes the world work. It's, it's, it's why everything happens the way it happens. Uh, and that, you know, airplanes take off and your kids manage to go to school and, you know, buses don't crash. Um, and I think that's how democracy works. I was an advisor. To, I worked in the Massachusetts State House. I, I was a legislative aide for um, the Ke guy named Ken Lemansky. He was the eighth Hamden uh rep and i was his legislative aide for two years um and then i worked in the senate you know democracy we don't live in a pure democracy we, we live in a republic where you have to trust people to make informed decisions on your behalf because we can't just have a big meeting in the square every day we can't just all crowd into you know court square in springfield and raise our hands and say okay i'm approving the budget it, we nobody has the time nobody has the knowledge for that and when the public says, I don't want, I want you to do exactly what I'm shouting through this megaphone, democracy starts to come apart. That, think of it this way. Think of how many people in this country do not know the difference between the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare and have called their member of Congress. I, this, I, can, this, I know that this has happened. I've talked to people, it's happened. they've said, I want you to repeal Obamacare and I want you to keep the Affordable Care Act. You cannot make a democracy function like that. Um, I mean, I, and so I, that's that concern, the link there 
to where we're at today is that I was not concerned about Donald Trump. I was concerned about something like Donald Trump. And again, it's happening in other places. I'll, I'll put in a, a, a not so humble brag about the book. When I wrote it, I thought I was writing about the United States. Uh, and I thought it was primarily, I was primarily aiming this at my own culture, my own country. The book is now uh, in 12 foreign languages, which I was, you know, as an author, you're very gratified, but that when I thought about it one day, it kind of terrified me because I, I, I didn't think this was a global problem. Uh, and it is. And I think it's, a, again, it's part of what happens when, you know, we grow. I, in the book, I talk a lot about education and how we now have very, a very therapeutic model of education that is spreading around the world, you know, where we ask students, are you, instead of saying to students, what do you know? Have you learned this material? We say, are you happy? Did you enjoy this? Would, you know, how do you rate it? Did, you know, would you do it again? Um, we have really created a culture of people who are resistant to learning things and resistant to cooperating if it involves admitting that they might not know something. And that's poison to a democracy. Thank you. So I'm gonna go to a question that's very topical because it's about a, um, I think a, a opinion piece in the New York Times this morning. And Suzanne asks, uh, Michael Sandel from Harvard says in the Times this morning, quote, the notion that, quote, the best and the brightest, unquote, are better at governing than less credentialed fellow citizens is a myth born of meritocratic hubris. Can you comment on this idea? Yeah, I always love when those arguments are made by someone who's uh, a tenured professor at an Ivy League school, because <laughs> you don't see him saying, "Well, you know, maybe I ought to give up this job and you know let the um, you know let the guy who drives the T teach this course for a while." Um, I think people misunderstand the term "the best and the brightest" because that's often been used as a term deployed against experts because of, of its association with a book on Vietnam. If you read that book, you realize that this was a, a, um, a problem where the best and the brightest were people who were kind of generically smart, um, who were pushing real experts out of the way, the people who really understood Southeast Asia, who understood military strategy, who, understood, who spoke Vietnamese, who knew this region. And they were saying, well, you know, I was really good at school. Now, if that is Sandel's, I haven't read the, the piece, uh, but I've seen you know, that's that th there was a piece like that today in the Wall Street Journal or yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, same same theory. Um, you know, if the argument is that just being good at your SATs doesn't mean you should run the world, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, be, saying I was really clever at going to school is not a qualification for anything. But I think people conflate that into, therefore, educated elites don't know anything. Um, and I'll give you an example. When doctors, when the news came out about eggs, remember this business that eggs are poison, right? And um, then it was, no, eggs are actually fine. Eat all the eggs you want. It turns out we can't really metabolize that cholesterol in it. I said to my own doctor, I, I like gave my own doctor hell and he kind of, you know, hung his head. He said, yeah, we screwed that up, you know. But I, when I was on the road talking about this, people would say, well, there you go, Tom. Proof that doctors really don't know anything about heart disease. You know, and I thought, if, you're, if your left arm goes numb or you, you get a pain in your chest, you're not going to call, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, the guy down the street. You're going to call 911. You're going to say, I want the guy who does cardiac surgery at Brigham. Um, and I think it's one of those conceits that people say, well, the average person can do all these things just as well as anybody else. That is a pernicious myth and one that has been exploded over and over again by the sheer incompetence of populist governments whenever they arise over the past 50 years. With that said, I completely agree with the people who say, you know, um, oh, that guy went to Harvard? Well, sure, make him Secretary of State. No, you should have, there should be a better reason than I went to Yale. Um, but you, I think there is a kind of reverse snobbery that has developed in America that says, if you went to Yale, and by the way, I didn't go to Yale, I didn't go to Harvard, I didn't graduate from either of them, that, you know, if you went to Yale, therefore you are disqualified because you are an elite and therefore evil. I think measuring people on what they've achieved and what they know and what they can demonstrate in terms of capability. My first election, one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan. No, you know, 
not an ounce of education in the man other than a small college in Illinois, I think he did just fine. But there is intelligence in knowing when to delegate to people. Ronald Reagan's chief Soviet advisor was, wait for it, a distinguished lifetime professor at Harvard University. That's where he was getting his advice. That's when I think political leaders and educated elites work well together. It seems like one of the one of the enemies is sweeping generalizations, saying, you know, all college educated people are idiots, or you know, or vice versa. You know, it's just, you know, the world is more nuanced than 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 than, uh, than sometimes uh, Twitter or social media makes you think. Well, it's also you're... getting our resent our petty resentments out of the way. Um, you know, it's that uh, resenting people simply because they are experts or because they went to a particular school is just childish uh, at some point. And yeah. we've really developed that. We have become this insanely resentful society. Uh, in the book, I talk about how much time we spend just peeking in on each other's lives, um, trying to outdo each other and saying, you know, that I know stuff and I'm smart and I have a good life. Um, we are constantly measuring ourselves against other people. Um, I, I, I am not a fan of, you know, test-based meritocracy. I have been a college professor for 30, I don't even want to say how many years, longer than I care to admit. And I know that maze bright, you know, test, test capable students are sometimes not good students and not interesting. Um, but we do have to have some way of identifying people among ourselves who are more competent than others. And I think that's an important part of this that gets lost because then you start, going, as one of my friends, I'll, I'll just wrap this up by saying, one of my friends has a great saying. He said, the answer to an appeal to authority is not to counter it with an appeal to ignorance. Thank you. So uh, Vanessa um, says, does um, this trend have, it kind of goes with what you're saying, have something to do with the academic priorities schools have given to state testing assessments rather than the more liberal arts education some of us had growing up. So it's, that sounds like uh, what you were discussing just now. And uh, LaVon asks, is this tendency more, to, again, this is something that in some ways you just addressed, is this tendency more typical of Americans than people from other countries? And have you studied the phenomenon outside of the USA? Um, I thought it, it was more pronounced in the United States, and I think it probably still is. Um, although uh, I spent, after the book came out, it was a big hit in Italy. And I actually went to Italy several times to talk about this and talked with a lot of people there who do education and polling. And so I don't, I don't speak Italian. I don't claim to be an expert on Italy. Um, their argument was that a lot of what they've been through with these kooky populist governments um, they, they had a government, for example, it was a party that was led by a guy who's a professional comedian. Um, they, the, a lot of what they were seeing tracked with what I had written about, and the book actually became a bestseller in Italy, which kind of shocked my socks off. Um, whether it's true, I mean, there's a Japanese, there's a chi Chinese edition of it. Are these problems in Japan, China? I don't know enough to answer that question. There, there's the mark of an expert. I don't know enough to answer that question. Um, but I assume there's a reason that the book is, you know, being so widely read. That's great. Um, Cheryl asks, do you think celebrity has replaced expertise? Oh, boy, do I. Um, there's a, there's a lot, I should say a lot. There's a significant part of the book when we get to things like the internet about celebrities. And um, of course, I could not resist. I was one of the early bashers of Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, you know, it, that, that's, this is crazy. Um, I kind of miss the days when the personal lives of celebrities were a mystery to us. You know, that who we saw on the screen was whoever they were. Uh, if you're taking your advice on feminine health and reproductive health from Gwyneth Paltrow on a website, you need to rethink that. And this, is, this goes back to my question when Kevin and I were talking, you know, what can we do about it? Here's a good idea. Don't get your health advice from an actress on a website where she's trying to sell, sell you, um, I can't, you know, scented candles and that I can't even talk about. Um, you know, don't <laughs> just don't do it. You know, there are reason there are there are, there's a reason gynecologists exist, and Gwyneth Paltrow is not a gynecologist. So yes, celebrity. We have 
we have become a more performative culture because of this narcissism that, in, that has infested our culture. And we therefore admire performativeness in others. And we take our cues from celebrities. Uh, that explains a lot about, you know, the cult of personality that has developed, that dev I would argue that a cult formed around Barack Obama, formed around Donald Trump. It's why actors and actresses can, you know, tell you not to take vaccines and people shrug and say, okay, you know, who am I to argue with Jenny McCarthy? Um, so I, I think it's really dangerous. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say to uh, our audience, we've had a question about repeating the title of your book. It's The Death of Expertise. Tomorrow we'll send an email out to everyone who registered with a link um, to Tom's book. And also another person asks, is there some way I can send this recording to friends? Yes, we'll also send you a link to the recording of tonight's uh, conversation. And you're absolutely welcome to share it with others. And a question just came in from uh, Kim in Connecticut. Has your book been translated into Russian? Yes, it's, um, it's right there behind me, actually, <laughs> okay. on the shelf, the Russian version, uh, which, um, you know, I thought was pretty cool being a lifelong Russia guy. And I've, I've read some of it. The translation's not bad, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's been translated into Russian, Ukrainian, Indonesian, Finnish, Ukrainian. Um, yeah, it's there's Romanian, um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of versions out there. Fantastic. Uh, Mike asks in Hofstadter's anti-intellectualism, published sixty years ago, and Eisenberg's White Trash, published a couple of years ago, faith and in particular evangelism are a part of the death of expertise. Can you comment on religion and its relationship to the death of expertise? Sure, I, I loved Hofstetter's book. I did not like Eisenberg's book. I thought it was, I thought it was more of an agenda there than I was comfortable with. Um, but Ho, I think um, Hofstetter, you know, when back in the 60s, talked about this as well as kind of a larger problem of um, you know, the modern world and religion, Protestantism, kind of fundamentals Protestantism, having a hard time dealing with this. Um, it, it's a strange issue for me because I come from a non-evangelical religion. I'm Greek Orthodox. Um, went to church in Holyoke in the area. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I agree that ev evangelicalism has always had this problem that for evangelicals, the text says what it says. You don't need anything, inter any intermediaries. You are capable of just comprehending this, you know, by by, by study and reading and sitting down. Um, my tradition is closer to a kind of Catholic tradition of interpretation, works of the Church Fathers, theological debates, um, and so on. So I, I I think that American, the American experience of the death of expertise. Uh, it definitely is informed by a tension with evangelicalism. But I also have to point out that that, that I would argue is the off-ramp in the 80s that the American right took. The off-ramp that the American left took was a, a distinctly secular version of that, which was postmodernism, which also said that the text says what you think it says, that, you know, that objective truth is negotiable, uh, and I think that, that that actually spread through the universities a lot faster than evangelicalism, which was primarily a problem of, of intellectual development among people of faith over on one side, and postmodernism kind of captured that on the other side. And the idea that somehow in between that you could be both an intellectual and a person of faith almost got lost. I mean, I, I'm, when, when I started my teaching career, um, people in universities used to say to me, you're, you're a religious man. How interesting. You know, is it like, you know, I was like from some tribe in the Amazon or something. Um, that is the equivalent of that guy in the bar I started out talking about it, saying, well, you're a professor, but you seem okay. There's a real hostility there. And yet these two intellectual off ramps in American life are so like each other because what is key here? that you are the center of everything. Your interaction with the material is the, is the central experience. And, um, you know, I, for myself, coming neither from that intellectual tradition 
nor from that religious tradition, I felt very caught between them. Um, and so I didn't really pick fights with either of them when I wrote the book because I just said, well, that, those, are, those two off ramps exist. What's left for the rest of us to talk about? Thank you. Uh, Jim asked, given the current circumstances, do you see any way to restore respect for and acceptance of actual facts, scientific evidence and reason? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I don't want to be too alarmist um, because the reality of everyone's lived experience is that no matter what they say, they rely on scientific expertise every day. Um, I have a, <coughs> excuse me, I have a particular gripe about the people who take flat earthers too seriously, right? We've had this resurgence of people say, well, I think the earth is flat, um, which I think is primarily attention seeking behavior because nobody acts as if the earth is flat, right? Nobody gets on an airplane and says, now listen, I, I want that flat earth flight and I want you to turn off the GPS because that's just propaganda from the National Bureau of Standards. You know, that's, that's just the Air Force selling you something. Nobody does that. Um, so in our daily lives, you know, we interact with expertise a million different ways that we don't even think about. And I actually have argued that part of the problem, part of this phenomenon that I call the death of expertise is because too many things are too easy now. Um, people, people say, you know, they look around the world and they say, well, how, how hard can it be? Look at what we're doing right now. There are hundreds of people with, in real time spread all around the country, wherever they are, all, all over the East Coast. Um, and I am talking to you from my home in Rhode Island. You know, people are watching, interacting with us. And, and we're, we're treating it like it's nothing, like it's easy. This is, everything we're doing right now is remarkably complex and not just in a scientific way. We had to pass laws. We had to create regulations. We had to do urban planning to lay down wires and cables. We had to establish, you know, legal um, requirements for who pays whom and who provides the energy. This act that we are engaging in at this moment required hundreds of experts to get things right. Um, and I, I should also, when I say experts getting things right, I should also add, yes, there is a section in the book. There's an entire chapter in the book about how experts get things wrong and why it's disastrous when they get things wrong. No one's but perfect. <laughs> on, on the day-to-day -day stuff, people say experts don't know what the hell they're doing. And yet here we are sitting right here. Thank you. So uh, several people asked a version of this question. Um, if Trump, if provided Biden wins in November, if Trump refuses to leave after the election, do you think the military will honor their oath to the Constitution and escort Trump out of the White House? Yeah, it's interesting. This is one of those problems where um, people have to become more familiar with their own system of government uh, because um, there is no way, I mean, assuming that on you know January 21st, the minute that Joe Biden says, I, so help me God, um, there is no more President Trump. And it won't be up to the military. The Secret Service, the president, the then president of the United States will turn to the Secret Service and say, you know, tell this guy to pack uh, and it'll be over. I personally don't think that's going to be a problem. I think that that, I worry about that month between November 3rd and the December, I think it's December 8th, which is the meeting of the Electoral College. That's where I, but I, I, I have never had anything but faith that the people, the men and women, and again, I don't represent the Defense Department, the Navy or anybody else. My personal experience is that the officers, the men and women in the United States military are constitutional loyalists. They will follow the orders of the elected commander in chief. But that, it, once it comes to inauguration day, it's a moot point. The, the only question is, does the electoral college certify a new president or not? And then after that, the machinery of government just grinds away. Uh, I, I, you know, my, I'll, I'll make one guess here that if Trump loses, he'll skip inauguration day. You won't have to pry him out of the. He'll, he's such a little boy and he's so sulky that I think he'll um, he'll pack up and go to New York and he'll he won't do the meet and greet and the first families meeting each other and having tea in the inauguration day. I think if he loses, Trump will say, "I'm not doing any of that," and he's going to go back to Mar-a-Lago or wherever. And, and skip all that. So I, I, but as a constitutional or governmental matter, it, it doesn't, 
it's once once by once the once the chief justice says congratulations, Mr. President, the whole U.S. government just acts differently, and it won't matter that Trump is going to say, "Well, I think I'm still the president." But if if the electoral college itself is disrupted, that's where the problem would be. Well, you know, but again, remember that the states send the electors. Like back a while back when Trump said, "Well, you know, maybe we should delay election day." He says stuff like this. He has no ability to do that. California and Massachusetts and New York and Texas, they're all going to say, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're in charge of our own elections. That's why it's a federal country. And they're going to send electors. Um, now, the person in charge of convening that is the vice president. I, personally, I don't think Mike Pence is going to say, well, I'm not meeting with the Electoral College. I, I mean, I think that, you know, that it's, there are, that at some point it be, that we have you know, gone into the realm of the insane. And I know everybody watching is saying, oh, but Tom, we're already there. I still think you know, the Electoral College, if the Electoral College meets, and that's gonna be Trump's challenge. He's gonna try and prevent that. You know, if, he's, if, it's a, if it's a close election, he's gonna try and prevent the Electoral College from certifying the victory. And because at that point, it's, it's just over. I mean, it's just done. Um, and there are millions of people, you know, throughout the country that are just going to say, you, can, you know, you can say whatever you want. You saw it with Bush v. Gore, right? We, we lived in this period of suspended animation in 2000, um, where, you know, finally the Supreme Court made a ruling about which recount to accept. And there was a validation of electors and the whole thing, you know, by December. Uh, and it didn't matter what happened after that. So I think people are on that you're worrying about the wrong thing. Worry about what happens the day after election day, because that's when the real mischief is going to start. Thank you. And uh, Rhonda says, uh, her husband says, don't be surprised when Trump flies to Moscow on Air Force One when he loses the election. Yeah, I, <laughs> he says look, he's I, kidding, I, but. But you know, it's, it's a, I've, I've been asked this question about, you know, when people have referred to Trump as a Russian agent and things like that. I, I think, you know, we, we that's a that's too simplistic an understanding of what I think is a much more complicated problem, which is that um, that I think that the president has a lot of dirty laundry that makes him innately afraid of confronting the Russians. I don't think Putin calls him up once a day and says disband NATO. I think Putin talks to him and says, you know, you know what would really help our relations is if you reduced your, your footprint in Germany. And Tony Trump- Soprano style. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> if you wanna be a friend, it would be the act of a friend, you know? And Trump, because he is scared to death of Putin says, okay, I get it. But th I, think, I think, you know, don't over, don't spin this into something it's not. Um, I think this is just, Trump is just afraid of the guy. And I think given what they know about him and given that they have all of his financial, don't, don't kid yourself. This thing about Trump not releasing his taxes, that's an American problem. The Russians know all this stuff. They've got everything. Mm -hmm. So now after the election, what does Trump do about the fact that he is still subject to things like state laws that he can't pardon himself out of? I mean, that he's going to be battling the Southern District of New York probably for the rest of his life. Um, I, I, I don't know. But I, you know, the, he's going to take off the Moscow stuff. First of all, I don't think the Russians want him. Uh, they have enough you know, to deal with, so. Thank you. So we're almost out of time. Uh, I have a question that's a little bit just not related to Trump <laughs> or the book, but 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 about your expertise in it. And uh, Carol asked, do you think Montenegro will be the next Crimea? No, uh, I don't think so. I think uh, Moldova could be the next Crimea. Um, but, my bigger fear is that um, uh, that he that in order to save himself, and I'm talking here about Putin, uh, if things get rough inside Russia and the you know, I mean, Biel a Belarus kind of situation develops, um, Trump may decide to pick a fight with somebody like Estonia, where there are you know he may say, oh, I have to protect the Russian speakers in Estonia. That's going to be his thing, right? Humanitarian. Prevent, uh, humanitarian assistance. And uh, that, that is the kind of stupid miscalculation that could escalate to World War III. 
So, you know, again, if you think about Tony Soprano with nuclear weapons, the good news is, the bad news is it's Tony Soprano with nuclear weapons. The good news is, if you remember Tony Soprano, he was a very cagey survivor, didn't look to pick a lot of fights that he couldn't win, mostly wanted to just keep earning, um, you know, and I think if you think of, of Putin that way, um, you know, nine times out of 10, that's, that's the way he's going to go. So I, I'm, I'm less worried about any one country becoming the next Ukraine. Because the other thing is the Russian military is bogged down in Ukraine. They're not having a good time. So, you know, we don't want to, the Russians aren't 10 feet tall. This is basically a regional power with a tiny GDP compared to everybody else in the developed world. And, and they've got their hands full. But, um, you know, if Putin feels desperate, that that could get that could get itchy. Thank you so much. I have to say there are so many good questions we didn't get to that we could have been here for another couple of hours. But uh, you can you can find Tom on on uh, once or twice a week on um, uh, on Twitter. I'm at oh, radio more than uh, once or twice a week on Twitter. Sorry. I said more than once or twice a week on Twitter. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Radio Free Tom, all one word. Um, people ask me where that came from. Uh, you know, I, I, it's a nostalgic call back to Radio Free Europe. And also, you know, REM is great too. Um, so if you're looking for me on Twitter, I'm at Radio Free Tom. Great. And we'll look for your upcoming Atlantic. Um, article, which sounds fascinating. And again, we'll send out record the uh, link to the recording and link to your um, death of expertise book to everybody who registered. And there's just one more comment I wanted to read from uh, someone in the audience tonight. Rochelle says, I left Pittsfield in 1960 and I have missed the Berkshire Eagle every day. Uh, so that that is just a, a most wonderful comment. Um, I want to thank Kevin Moran um, for being such a capable conversationalist and interviewer and the Berkshire Eagle for being a partner in this series and encourage everyone to go out and subscribe to the Eagle, like Tom says. I want to thank Tom for not violating the Hatch Act tonight and being here. <laughs> Even though he's a federal employee, he's not representing the Naval War College tonight. He is his own person here as a private person. And um, we uh, look forward to the next, um, the, the next conversation will be with Lawrence Burns. He is a former vice president of research and development at GM and wrote a book called Autonomy on driverless cars. And that conversation will be two weeks from tonight and you'll get more information in the email. So good night, everyone. Good night. And thank you once again, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks to Berkshire Bank and Berkshire Gas, and especially to our good friend, Chris Farrow, who connected us with Tom tonight. So thank you so much, Chris. You're the best. Good night, everyone. Good night.